This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit wogcc.com. To the Word this morning, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you so much for your Word. I thank you so much, God, that uh, you would just help me to speak it and articulate it in a way that would please you, the way that would have the most impact as led and directed by your Holy Spirit. And I pray the hearts of each person here would be softened and ready to receive your truth. Let their hearts be good ground, Father, that your truth, your seed, your word can be planted and it'll produce an awesome harvest in them and in those around us. Help it to reprogram our minds to think the way you would have us to think and to live the way that you would desire for us to live, God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into this message today, because we're still in our definition series, um, I, I, I want to tell you this. I think that a lot of times what happens with people uh, who have the opportunity to share the Word of God uh, too often in our day and age, and it's unfortunate that this happens, but people look at the Word of God as a tool to somehow manipulate and control other people. And that's not right. But that's not what God intended it for. God did not intend this holy scripture, this, this word of God to be used to manipulate or to control people. And so I think that a lot of times, however, what happens is that people, uh, people will abuse that and they will say, well, this is what I want you to do. And a lot of times we'll do it for personal gain. There will be a lot of manipulation and control. I know that the church that I grew up in, that a lot of times when things were taught, it was taught in a way where it was trying to you know, beat me down or trying to control me or things like that. The Bible is not a mechanism of control, but the Bible, is, the Bible brings freedom, okay? The Word of God brings freedom, not slavery. Amen? So we have to understand that when we go into the Word of God, because the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And so we need to understand that when we approach the Scripture. And so I'm going to teach this morning on a definition that's going to be a little bit different, because we've been hitting different definitions about church, about relationships, about humility, all these different things throughout this series. And this morning we're going to talk about giving, and we're going to talk about God's definition of what that word means when we talk about giving. We're going to talk about finances, we're going to talk about giving of our time, we're going to talk about giving of our heart, we're just going to talk about giving in general. And it's not done from a standpoint that is meant to control or manipulate, and I want you to know that up front, all right? I'm teaching you the Word of God because the Bible reveals to us the heart of God for you and for me. That's what the Word of God is. Amen, somebody? And so when I teach this to you, I'm not teaching this from a standpoint where someone would want to manipulate or would want to control. I'm teaching this to show you the very heart of God for you and for me because God is a giver. The Bible said that for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but would have everlasting life. So let's go into the scripture today and let's see what God has to say about this. So if you would just go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. We'll get to that in just a moment. Luke chapter 12. Before we do, I want to give you Webster's de definition of what giving means. And it's pretty good definitions here. Webster says to present voluntarily and without expecting compensation. That's a hard one. To give voluntarily without expecting compensation, to hand to someone, to place in someone's care, to grant permission or opportunity, etc., to impart or communicate like you're giving advice. And here's the thing about giving that you and I need to understand from the get-go. True giving is not an exchange. Because a lot of times when it comes to giving, we're looking at giving as little as we can to get as much as we can. We don't want to give very much, but we want to get a lot. Unless it's advice, of course, then we want to give a lot, and we don't want to really receive a lot. <laughs> but you see, a lot of times we'll approach one another, and we want to give as little as we can and get as much as we can back. That's why a lot of us are sales shoppers, because we want to go find those sales. D don't even play with me. We're all from Sheboygan County. I know what's up. We are Sheboygan shoppers, and that means we are savvy savers that we want to go out and save as much as we can. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to save as much as we can and us to be wise with our finances because God wants us to do that, and he definitely honors that. But I want you to understand something, that that same mentality that we take towards things uh, commercially, that we want to try to get as much as we can for as little as possible, a lot of times we take that same mentality towards God. And we say, God, I want to give as little as I can, but I want to get as much as I can from you. And so our relationship with God tends to be only really be, uh, 
be, be a part of what we can get out of the deal and not truly from a giving standpoint unless it's going to benefit me because I think that what we've done is just as a people as a whole, we create this culture that views giving as a great way to position ourselves to get what we really want. You know, kind of like at Christmas time. I'm going to get so-and-so this kind of gift and I hope that they get me what I asked for. Because they know I've been dropping hints everywhere, you know. Like they'll find the picture of what you want in random magazines and books that you know that, you know, your spouse or whoever will read. Or there will be random, you know, things that you'll tape to the, uh, the mirror in the bathroom or something like that. You're always dropping little hints. You know, I would really be nice if I had this. And we hope that if we give someone something that we're really going to get what we want. So I'm going to put a lot of thought and a lot of heart into what I'm giving you in hopes that you're going to give me what I want. And that's an exchange. That's us exchanging. And we take that same attitude towards God. And we say, God, I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my time. I'll give you my money. But I expect all of these other things in return. And the motive of my heart is not to give, is not to bless. The motive of my heart is to get something back in return. I know this because I was raised up in this type of teaching. I was raised up in this type of teaching that basically I remember our pastor just flat out saying as a child, we give to get. And that's what I was taught as a kid. And I had to unlearn that because my definition of giving was really skewed because I was giving because of what God was going to give me in return. I would actually give money towards things that I was believing God for that I wanted that I thought I needed. And I would say, I want this. I remember this happening in church as a kid. I remember one time that there was a window of heaven that was open. This is what the minister said, okay? There's a window of opportunity open right now in heaven that if you'll come and give a gift of $1,000 that God's going to do something special for you. And it's only open for the next five minutes, though. So people were feverishly writing checks and running down to the front, and they were throwing money all over the altar. I, this, this is just, just in my mind. I can see it so vivid, vividly. And then it got down to $500 and $100. And before you know it, the window of opportunity was still open for you for 50 cents. Could you bring And there were thousands of dollars here at this person's feet, and all of these people were just looking for hope, giving that money, not because they felt led to give as much as they felt led what I'm going to get in exchange for what I'm giving. And that was the motive. The motive was this window was open, and I'm going to get something from this, and so if I can get something from it, shoot, i got some needs. If I, can, if I can get in with God and it only cost me 100 bucks, shoot, I'll do it. And that was the mentality that a lot of people took towards giving. We call it the prosperity gospel. Now, do I believe in prosperity? Absolutely. Do I believe God will bless you? Absolutely. But I don't give to get. I don't give because of what God does for me and what he's going to give me in return because that puts the focus on me and it makes me very selfish. And it makes it all about me. Makes it all about me and what I get out of the deal. Or I I think that somehow I can control God by giving. I remember when I was a youth pastor. I was 18 years old, okay, in Arkansas. I was a youth pastor. And every Wednesday night I would have youth service. And so Wednesday, during the day, I would commit that whole day to prayer and fasting. Ooh, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And let me tell you, I was praying and fasting because I thought that if I prayed and fasted, that God was going to do certain things in my service that I wanted him to do. Like, it was always like a really win, uh, a really big win when I was a youth pastor, if I could make teenagers cry. So that was kind of the goal, you know. Oh, I had a good service last night. I had 10 kids cry. You know, I mean, that was was a good youth service. So I was trying to make kids cry, you know, because they're so moved by God or so convicted by what I was preaching or whatever it was. I wanted them to cry. Because you knew that life change was happening when they were crying. So I would fast and pray. And then nobody would cry. And I would get mad at God. I would. I am standing here honestly telling you I would get mad at God. Because I thought, God, didn't you see me fast and pray? You owe me. And I would somehow think that I can put God in my debt. And I can say, God, you owe me because don't you see what I did for you? Now, what are you going to do for me? I made it all about what I wanted. And, you know, I think God knew better than me what those kids needed in those youth services. 
was I really after what those kids needed or was I after what I wanted? I was more after what I wanted. God knew what they needed. God knew what needed to happen. Was it good that I was fasting and praying? Sure, there's nothing wrong with that, but my heart was wrong. My heart was wrong in the fact that I thought I could control God. Listen to me, folks. You cannot control God. You can't control him no matter how badly we want to. Because here's the thing. True giving does not want to control. True giving does not seek control. True giving is not looking for control. Here's the thing. True giving is a release of ownership. That's what true giving is. I remember at a church that I served in in Oklahoma, there was a guy, really good guy, really nice guy. Uh, he was very uh, well-to-do financially guy. And... Um, and, and he wanted to start giving things to the church. So he started buying things that he wanted the church to have. And that was cool because some of the things he wanted the church to have, I wanted the church to have. He was buying the church cool stuff. And that was cool until he got unhappy. Something happened that he got upset about. And so one day we show up on a Sunday morning and the thing that he had bought that I was really excited about that cost thousands of dollars was not there. Where did it go? And we depended on that piece of equipment that he bought every weekend. We show up at church. Oh, we find out later he got mad about something and ended up taking his toys and going home. Why? Did he really give that? No. He really didn't give it. He was still holding on to it, and he was trying to manipulate and control things to go the way he wanted them to go because of what he gave. And we have to understand, when we give, we release ownership. We have to ask ourselves, are we a giver or, or, or do we look at ourselves as a stockholder? Because stockholders want to control. And we want to say, I'm really not giving you this. I'm really only going to let you use it because I want to lord over it. Or I want power in exchange for my gift. That's not really a gift. That's not really something that you're giving. That's something that you're wanting to exchange power for or say so or control. Right? It's not really a gift. It's not really a gift because true giving, the heart of a true gift, does not seek to control. I remember one time that someone uh, wanted to buy me a weed eater. You don't know what a weed eater is. It's, I guess we call them weed whackers uh, in the north. In the south, we called everything by the brand that it was. You know, so if it's a weed eater brand, they're all weed eaters. You know, all of them that do the same thing. Just like Coke. You go to a restaurant in the south and you say, I want a Coke. They say, what kind? And you're like, Dr. Pepper, and that makes sense down south, and that doesn't really make sense up here, because we call everything the brand. I mean, that's what it is. It's a brand, and so that's how that works. Well, this guy said, you, I, I'm going to buy you a weed eater. Apparently, he had been to my house and saw that I was in need, um, <laughs> and so I, I really need to shape up my yard. So he takes me and buys me a weed eater, lets me pick it out and everything, bought me a can of gas, bought me the little oil stuff you mix in with the gas, um, bought me... Uh, two packs of, of line, everything. I'm like, thank you so much. This is a huge blessing. About a year goes by, and I haven't seen this guy in about six months. Here's a knock on my door. And I open the door, and it's this guy. I say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. And he says to me, he says, uh, yeah, I'm here to pick up my weed eater. <laughs> what? I'm here to pick up my weed eater. I said, your weed eater? I said, I thought you bought that for me. No, 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 I just bought that to let you borrow it. Well, I found out that this guy had fallen on hard times, and he was wanting to take it and hock it at the pawn shop. For a few bucks. And I'm going, really? And because I want to preserve relationship, I let him have it. I'm not going to make a big deal about a weed eater. I mean, that's goofy to do stuff like that. So I said, relationship's more important. So I let it go. But I'm sitting here feeling like, man, he really didn't give that to me. He wanted to control and dictate and do things. You know, just like sometimes, this, hap this can happen in family sometimes where a family will, you know, give someone money or give them something and then they want to say so and they want to be able to control things. And you're almost like, man, I wish you wouldn't have given it to me if I knew that that was going to come attached with it. Nobody knows what I'm talking about or either you're not being honest because you're sitting next to them. <clears throat> but <laughs> you have to ask yourself, I I is this a loan? Because if it's a loan then there's some say so and some control. It's just, if it's a gift, then there's no control. Otherwise, it's not a gift. It's an exchange. Because true giving does not seek control. Amen, somebody. You see, true giving is done without stipulation, without strings attached. I had a guy tell me last night that came to church. He said, well, pastor, said, I was going to buy you a new pair of shoes for Christmas. He says, but they have strings attached to it, so I guess I can't give them to you. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Boo. Yeah, I can't wait. 
<laughs> that was terrible. Why I thought of that. You know how sometimes you just think of things and they just come out of your mouth? And then you're like, why did I share that? That was stupid. Okay. Anyways, true giving is done without stipulation, especially when you give to God because you're saying, God, I trust you and I'm giving this to you from my heart. In other words, you're saying, I release ownership, right? I'm releasing ownership and I'm saying, God, this is yours. So if you're giving in the offering, if you're giving toward, to God, if you're blessing someone, a, a neighbor, a friend, if you're giving them a gift, release it. Let it go. Otherwise, it's not a gift. You guys say, I'm giving this to you. And understand why gifts and why giving is so special. Because the Bible says here in Luke chapter 12 in verse 34 that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is. And he's talking about money there. He's not talking about like Jake and the Neverland Pirates. You have a buried treasure somewhere. He's, he's talking about actual money. And he's saying this, this is where your money is. That's where your heart's going to be because your money represents your time. You give your employer or whoever it is your time. And you say, this is me giving you my time. In exchange for that, you're giving me money. And then when I give my money away, when I give that to someone or when I bless someone or when I give at church and give to God, I'm actually investing my life. That's a lot deeper than just dropping a $20 bill in an offering plate, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot more to that. I'm actually giving of myself because we all have the same amount of time. We all might be at different levels of compensation for that time. But we all have the same amount of time. So when we give of our money, we're saying, I'm giving my life. I'm giving a portion of my heart. And I'm saying, I trust this with you, God, because where your treasure is, that's, that's where your heart's going to be also. Because here's the thing, giving is really a hard issue. That's really bottom line. Whether it's giving your time to someone, whether it's giving your finances, whether it's giving of your heart, it really boils down to a heart issue. Amen, somebody? Amen. Here's the thing. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave. He loved and loved caused him to give. The attitude came before the gift. The Bible doesn't say God gave his only son. The Bible says that God loved and he gave. I think there's a big difference there. Because I believe what the Lord is trying to show us is that the attitude of the giver is more important than just giving a gift. Amen? The attitude and the heart, the motivation, the intent of why that gift is given and why I'm doing this is more important than just giving a gift. So let me ask us this question, and I just want us to do a little soul searching. What is our motive in our heart to give? Why do we give? Do we give out of fear because maybe we're afraid of what's not going to happen or what's going to happen? Do we give out of greed? Do we give out of obligation? Do we give out of this sense of exchange that we talked about? Or do we give out of love? Because that's what God said. He said, I'm going to give out of love. I loved you so much that it caused me to give. In the book of Acts, in the 20th chapter, I want to read you something. Acts 20 and verse 33. Acts 20 and verse 33 says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we all know this. We all have heard this before. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive, right? Matter of fact, some of us, we've been to like little craft shows and we bought these little wood plaques where someone, you know, did a little wood carving in there and it says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we have it hanging above our kitchen sink. I mean, we know this, right? We know this saying, it's more blessed to give than receive. We say that to people when we're being snooty. You know, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. <laughs> and, and we think about it, though. And we think maybe, just maybe, with this whole blessed to, more blessed to give than to receive, we think maybe God doesn't understand how awesome it is to receive. <laughs> maybe he's never really received anything because receive awesome maybe god missed it somewhere because i mean i've received some things and it was a lot of fun and i'm going but it's more blessed to give than it is to receive really 
So, so here's the thing. Either God's right and we're wrong, which he is and we are. Or either I'm, I'm missing something. I must be missing something about this whole it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I love giving Christmas gifts to my children this year. And I get to see a little heart of the Father God as a father myself. Because I was excited about what I got. I got a cool present for Christmas. But I was more excited about seeing my kids open up their present. Oh, this is a Lego set. Wow. My wife, she was taking pictures with her camera, and she was zooming in on the kids' faces because that's what she was trying to get was their reaction. Why? Because just seeing them light up. Oh, it's a wrestler. Oh, it's, a, you know, my little pony. Oh, man, they're just freaking out about this stuff, and they loved it. And they, you know, you see that, one, and you go, okay, I'm getting a picture, a small picture of what that means, that it's actually more blessed to give than it is to receive. That the heart of God says that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And the Bible says this too about giving. It says that God loves a cheerful giver. We know that. We've heard that. God loves a cheerful giver. We know it's in the Bible somewhere. We're not sure where, but we know it's in there. Give me a minute. I'll look it up on my phone. The Second Corinthians chapter 9 is where that's found. So if you have your Bible, I want you to go there because I want to show you something about this. Second Corinthians chapter 9. We hear the scripture a lot. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, here's the situation, what was going on. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church because he's about to come and see them, okay? He's about, to come say, he's about to come see the Corinthian church, and they're all jazzed about it because they love Paul. But Paul wants to remind them real quick, too, that they promised him an offering when he showed up. And he said... Now, so this won't be a hardship on you guys. I'm going to send some Macedonians before me. They're actually going to come before I get there, and they're going to help you guys to get this, these funds ready that you promised me. So apparently they had promised him something significant if you've got to send some people ahead of time to, you know, help prepare this offering, right? So this has to be a significant offering that Paul was promised. And he's reminding the Corinthians here in, in 2 Corinthians 9 that they promised him this offering. He said, now you, you promised me this, and I'm reminding you of it. But what he said about the promised offering is very important, and it's key. So let's watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, the Bible says this. Therefore, I thought it was necessary to exhort or encourage the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it might be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Stop right there. Paul said, listen, you promised me this thing, but I don't want this to be a grudging obligation. Have you ever told someone you were going to do something or give something to someone and you forgot about it? And then when you were reminded of it, it was a grudging obligation? Like, you know, when you, you told your buddy that you were going to help them paint if you ever need, you know, who, I mean, some of you might be weird and you might love to paint, but I don't. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, you told your buddy, hey, I'm, I'm going to redo this room sometime. Well, when you do, you just let me know. I'd love to come help you. And then two weeks later, hey, you remember when you were over? Oh, and you go over there out of grudging obligation. Or you had got invited over to someone's house and you said, yeah, we're going to do that. And then you're driving along with your wife in your car and, and he says, oh, I've got big plans for Saturday night. And she said, no, you don't. And he said, what are you talking about? Yes, I do. No, you don't. You're not going to get to sit around and relax and watch the game. We've got to go over to the Joneses' house. She goes, what? Well, what are you talking about? Don't you remember? We told them two weeks ago. Oh. <laughs> you know, when those things happen, you go, oh. And you do those things, but you do it out of a grudging obligation. I told someone I was going to give them this. Oh. So Paul is telling the Corinthians, he's saying, listen, I'm going to go ahead and send some guys beforehand to make sure that your generous gift is not done out of grudging obligation. In other words, Paul was telling them, I'm more concerned about the heart behind the giver than I am the gift. Okay? This is what Paul's saying. So let's read on in verse 6. But this I say... He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So in other words, the, the church at Corinth must have been struggling financially. And they were concerned about having to get this gift ready. And so they were considering not giving him as much as they said they were going to give him. 
And he let them know, hey, if you're going to sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. God is looking at your heart. If you're going to sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. He, and, and then he's telling them all these things. I'm going to actually help make this easier on you guys. Verse 7, he says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Notice the word cheerful comes before the word giver. He didn't say God loves a giver. He said God loves a cheerful giver. He said that the attitude, the heart that directs the gift of the giver is more important to the Lord. He's looking at our heart, folks. And he's looking at our heart in everything, whether that be giving God our time, whether that be giving God and trusting him with our finances, whatever the case may be, God is looking at our heart. Amen? That's what he's looking at. Not at, at, you remember the story where, where Jesus was in the temple and there was an offering being received and these priests and these religious guys walk up and they just fill up all this stuff and everybody's like, what? Did you see what that guy put in the offering? What? It's like crazy. And then another guy comes up and they're all like, what? Did you see what the guy put in the offering? That's crazy. And then a little old widow woman comes up and drops two pennies in the offering. And Jesus said, you see that lady right there? She just gave more than all those guys. What? Did you not see the what? <laughs> Did you not see that, Jesus? They gave the, remember? The bling bling. And she gave the ching ching. <laughs> Did you not see that, Jesus? He said she gave more. Why? Because she gave all she had. She gave from her heart. Because God was more interested in the lady's heart than he was the big impressive gift. So Paul says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. You see, even though God does bless our giving, he does. He blesses our giving when it's done from our heart. We don't give to get. We give out of our love for God and our love for people. The fact that we get blessed because we give is like a fringe benefit of giving. Okay? We give because we love. We give because we're cheerful. We give because we have been blessed to be a blessing. Not because we're giving grudgingly or because we're giving greedily. You see, that's why we give. Because we love God, we love people. We give to support the work at Word of Grace and what He's called us to do. We give to help those that God places in our paths and on our hearts. We don't give sparingly, but freely. We give it freely. Because maybe God's putting someone on your heart that you know has a need. Or maybe they don't have a need. God's just put them on your heart and you feel like you, you, you're supposed to bless them in some way. Maybe you're supposed to go shovel somebody's driveway. You know? Maybe you're supposed to go uh, write a check to someone. Maybe you're supposed to help someone that you know is, is struggling. And whatever it may be that God is, is calling you, maybe, maybe God's calling you to step up and give of your time in other ways. Whatever the case may be, that don't do so sparingly, but do so generously and freely. Because the Bible says, freely you have received, so freely we need to give. Amen? We've received so freely, the gift of love, the gift of grace, the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Something you and I could have never fixed or done or amended on our own. He did it for us all by his big bad self. And we receive that freely. But he says, freely you receive, so freely you give. You see, this is not something that's supposed to bring bondage or condemnation. This is something that's actually supposed to bring freedom. Because you've received it freely. So you're supposed to freely give. Because when we, we give, that's the heart of God. It's the heart of God. And, and, and understand something. That when He has blessed you, when He has given you the things that you have, when He has given you the opportunities that you have, He has called us to be good stewards of what He has given us. Amen? <laughs> that's what that sounded like from up here. I'm not sure. He's called us to be good stewards of what he's given because God blesses stewardship. God blesses stewardship. A lot of times we miss that. We miss that so many times. And, and we go to God when we have a need, when we're in dire straits, when we don't know what to do, and we go, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay this 
this bill. I don't know. I got so much credit card debt. God help me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to church. I will sleep in the church parking lot when they ain't having church because I'm just going to give to you. I'm going to volunteer for everything. I'm going to sign up for everything. I'm going to wake up an extra 30. I'm going to wake up an extra 10 minutes, Lord, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to spend time with you, and I'm going to just give you my heart. I'm going to read the Bible in all them different translations, and I'm just going to give you everything, God, because I really need something from you right now. And then let's say that, you know, God is a God that even in the midst of our foolishness, even in the midst of some of our stupidity, He still will bless us and He still will bail us out of circumstances that we can't explain it any other way than God. He does that. But here's what happens. Here's the danger when we don't learn how to be good stewards. Is that, let's say... We've got a mountain of debt. We don't know how we're going to pay it. And then all of a sudden, one day, you hear this great story about how, you know, this person had all this debt. They walked out to the mailbox one day, and they opened up the mailbox, and there was a check for the exact amount that they had to pay. And it was at the last minute of the last day of the last second. Thank you, Jesus. And they get up here, and they tell that testimony. The church high five slaps, and they dance around, and they go, Woo, isn't God good? And then they go, I wonder how that person got that. I want to do what they did so I can get that in my life, too. And then we go and we try to formulate God and we try to slam him in a can or in some type of V8 juice drink where we just drink it down and we get all of our God nutrients that we need so we can have what the other person had and God will do for us what he did for the other person the exact same way that it happened in their life. Well, brother, you're just not doing what I did. Apparently you don't have enough faith. (laughs) Apparently you missed the window of heaven that was open there. Did you miss that one? Oh, darn. Missed that window of heaven was open and a lot of people think that or here's the thing that that we miss is that when God does do things like that and he does it's crazy blows my mind when things like that happen where people will get that check that they needed and they didn't know where this was coming from or where that was coming from that's wonderful that's great I praise God for that but if you don't learn to be a good steward after that you will end up in the exact same situation or worse than you were before God brought me out of this financial situation, this financial crisis. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's so great. Let's go shopping. Because there's some other stuff that I think that I need that I can't live without. And so I'm going to go charge up all my credit cards, even though I just got out of credit card debt. And and, and I'm going to go apply for a bunch of new ones because I want more stuff. And then I go, look at me. I'm blessed. And then all of a sudden, I'm not so blessed when I can't pay the bill. And then I go, God, I need you again. Remember me. I need another check, and I'm opening my mailbox every day going, no, it's not there today. (laughs) Okay, it happened last time. (laughs) Now listen, listen, a lot of people do that. And they think that they can somehow, you know, manipulate God into fixing that for them because, okay, I'm going to get back down my knees again. I'm setting my alarm early again. I'll sleep in the church parking lot again. I'll do all this stuff again so you can bail me out again. And we always want God just when we need to be bailed out of a situation. We're not really giving any of that to God. We're not giving him our time. We're not giving him our heart. We're just hoping we get an exchange out of the deal that gets us out of the mess we got ourselves in. God blesses good stewardship. If God does do a miracle in your life where something like that happens and you get out of debt or God takes care of something financially for you, guess what? Now you're in a great position to start over and to be a good steward of what you have now. That means learn to live within your means. Amen? Amen. It means to learn, learn to say no to all the latest deals and promotions. Live within your means. Begin to... Begin to use wisely what you have because God blesses stewardship. Jesus himself taught a parable of God blessing stewardship. And it went like this. He said that there was a master who had three servants. And he gave each one of them talents, each one according to his own ability. And when he's talking about talents, he's talking about money. That was a denomination of money. He's not talking about he gave each one of them talents where they can rub their belly, pat their head, and whistle Dixie at the same time. (laughs) He gave each one of them talents. He gave each one of them money, significant amounts of money. A talent was a lot of money, okay? Matter of fact, uh, about an average, normal, blue-collar worker, day's wage was called a denarii. And a talent was 6,000 denarii. That's how much a talent was. He gave one guy five talents. That's a lot. He gave another guy two talents. He gave the other guy one talent. The Bible says each one the master gave to him according to his ability. His ability to what? To handle it. His ability to steward it. 
And then when they came back and he was calling them all back to see what they had done with the money, sometime later, the guy that had five went out and made five more with it. He invested it with bankers, made some money, did some wise things. The guy that had two, he also doubled his. The guy that had one, though, he buried it. And he hid it because he was afraid. And the, the master was very angry with that servant. And Jesus said that he said, take the guy that has the one talent, take it away from him, give it to the guy that has ten. Because obviously he knows what to do with this thing. And he tells each one of these guys that did well, he said, he said that you have been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. In other words, God was saying, I'm blessing you because you've proven yourself responsible and faithful stewards over what I've given you. Now, you have increased your capacity to handle more. Some people, the worst thing you could do for them is let them win the lottery. Right? We've seen those stories where people thought, I need money, it's going to fix my problem. More money, more problems, right? That's me getting gangster up in here. It's not always the answer. It's in there. It comes out from time to time. <laughs> but listen, this stuff happens. It happens all the time. You'll see somebody that won a million dollars. Oh, wow, I'd love for that to be me. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe your capacity isn't at that level to be able to handle that if you had it happen overnight. Because he gave talents according to each one's ability. Every one of us has a capacity of responsibility to operate within what we have been blessed with. Are we givers? Are we people that are cheerfully giving? Are we people that are being responsible with what we have? Or are we living crazy outside of our means, wanting God to bail us out all the time, hoping that if we give, God's going to just keep on bailing us out? That's wrong motive. That's wrong heart. We're never going to learn from that. We're never going to grow from that. If we're always looking for something to be our, our magic pill, for something just to uh, instantly change everything. No, no. You can give someone $100 and you can give them a million dollars and they could create a big mess with it if the heart isn't right. Doesn't matter the amount. They'll create a mess with it either way because they haven't learned how to be a good steward of what they have been given. So I would challenge you, learn how to budget, learn how to live within your means, learn how to say no to some things and say yes to putting money back, to begin to invest properly, to begin to look for new opportunities to advance and to grow. And, 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 and are you being the type of employee that's being a good steward of the job that you have? Are you being a good steward of the responsibilities that you've been given at work? You know, everybody always thinks that, oh, I could do the manager's job better than the manager. Well, you don't know until you're sitting in the manager's chair. Let me tell you. I used to think that when I was a youth pastor. Oh, I could be a pastor. I could tell that guy, oh, he don't know what he's doing. Yeah. We all think that we could do that. But when you're sitting in the chair, it's different, folks. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's different. A lot of things you begin to understand when you begin to grow in responsibility. Immaturity always thinks that it knows better than everyone else. Maturity is going to say, I'm going to be responsible for what I have and I'm going to grow from there. And I'm going to look for opportunity to grow. I'm going to look for opportunity to expand. I'm going to look for opportunity to begin to build a good foundation. Because I don't want my kids and their kids to keep struggling like I've struggled because I'm going to be a good steward of what I've been blessed with. Amen? And I'm going to teach stewardship to my kids. I'm going to teach stewardship to their kids. I, I want them to be good stewards because I want to be a good steward because God blesses stewardship. That's what the Bible says. Amen, somebody? Amen. I hope that this message on giving has, has helped you today. I want to give you four things to take away real quick before we close that I believe are going to help us during this holiday season and, and beyond, you know, not just during this Christmas, you know, season, but uh, I believe it's going to continue to help us. Number one is we have to give from our heart, not as what, not what's convenient or something just to ease our mind. Okay. This has to be a heart thing is each one purposes in their heart. Number two, giving is an expression of love, worship, and trust to God. That's why a lot of times we'll include uh, giving here at the church, you know, with, in our worship, because it really is worship, because it's just saying, God, I'm honoring you with this, and I'm trusting you, Father. Number three, understand that God is your source, and he will satisfy you like no one or nothing else can. Number four, nothing could ever repay God for the gift that he gave us. A lot of people spend their lives trying to repay God. You can't repay God. You can't repay somebody for a gift. If you repay someone for a gift, then guess what? Not a gift, right? Hey, I got you this great 
you know, 60 inch LED TV for Christmas. Oh, let me pay you back for that. No, it's a gift. I really didn't get you one, so don't get too excited. <laughs> but even if I did and you tried to pay me back, that would negate the fact that it was a gift. That would make me feel like you didn't really receive the gift. You thought that you could somehow pay me back. You can never pay God back for sending us his son. You can never do it. You can never do it. That's why we don't serve God out of obligation. We serve him out of love. We get to serve him. Amen? It's not that I have to serve God. It's I get to serve God. It's not I have to give. It's I get to give. It's not I have to serve and I have to do this. It's I get to. I get to be a part of the family of God because of Jesus. I get to be a part of something I had no business being a part of because of my sin. Because I was dead before Jesus. But because of Christ, I've been raised to life, seated with Him together in heavenly places. And now He is blessing me. He is taking care of me. He is pro- he's providing for me. He's blessing me. All these things. And I had nothing to do with it. It's all because I'm part of His family. And it's not that I have to do this. It's I get to do this. We get to come together and have church. Amen? don't want you to ever feel like I have to come to church out of obligation to fill my religious duty and to check off my goody goody list with God no we get to do this folks it is an honor and a privilege to get to do this it's an honor that I get to preach the word of God it's an honor that we get to serve together and we get to do life together we get to do this because Jesus has opened the door for you and for me amen would you bow your heads this morning Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.